What was the hardest thing to adjust to when you first came into this prison? I've always naively, I guess, thought that women were the gentler sex, that the weaker sex, that's what society wants us to believe. And the fact that women can stab a man to death 40 times, I find that incomprehensible. South of Chicago, in the state of Indiana, two prisons hold some of America's most dangerous female criminals. The Rockville Correctional Facility and Indiana Women's Prison house over 1,800 offenders. Many are serving long sentences for extremely violent crimes. Some will end their days here. How severely was the victim hurt? The bullet came into close contact with his eye and it, it shot him in the face. Yes. For four weeks, I was given access to a world and a culture, the like of which I've never known. So you were classed as a baby killer? I was that, I am that. I'm a lot more than that as well, but that's who I am. America imprisons more women than anywhere else in the world. My second visit to Indiana Women's Prison began in its segregation unit. The prisoners here are among the most dangerous, and some have been punished for breaking the rules. They are locked down for 23 hours a day and have no contact with the rest of the institution. Miss Boyd? Yes. Some people here would like to meet you. Yeah, so I'm gonna close the door behind you. Step right here. You step in front of your door for me, for me. Okay. Thank you very much for coming out of your cell to talk mm -hmm. to us. No problem. Uh, how, how long have you been in this segregation unit? In about a week, it'll be four months. So. Well, what's that like? It's hard, especially being pregnant. You're pregnant? Yeah. Well, when did you f find out you were pregnant? Where? Um, when I got arrested. They gave me a pregnancy test at um, the county jail while I was there, and I found out there. And I was already like a, a month in my pregnancy, because I'm five months right now. It's one thing to be pregnant in, in any general prison population. It must be particularly agonizing to be pregnant and to be in a segregated cell. Yeah, like I said, you feel alone, you feel like I mean, it's so depressing to where, like, every day at 6 o'clock, where when we get mail, you sit there on your bed and you look under your door to see if you get mail. And when you don't, like, I sit there and I cry because I feel like everybody just forgot about me. And being pregnant is even worse because my hormones are driving me crazy. One minute I'm mad, one minute I'm even madder, one minute I'm really upset. It's just an emotional roller coaster in this little room by myself. When was your last communication with the father of your child? Before we came here. Th th is this your first baby? No, I have a daughter. She's five. She's with my mother right now. What does your five-year-old make of, uh, of your situation? Because she is probably of the age where she's just <laughs> about beginning to comprehend that her mother is not around. Oh, yeah. I talk to her. She knows that I've been in trouble, and she tells me like it is. I'll call her at home, and she'll tell me, why can't you just stop getting in trouble and be home with me? And, you know, she tells me she's, she's like the mom, and I'm the child. That's what it seems like right now. Boyd escaped from a prison work program, which was based in the local community. Her punishment is six months in this unit. Pregnant women who do follow the rules 
criminals and who have committed less serious crimes are put in a separate wing. Once they're about to give birth, they are taken to a local hospital. Their babies will then spend the first months of their lives back here. Brooke, how long have you been in prison? I've been here since September. And when was your... He was born December 6th. What's his name? Zayden. Zayden. How well did they look after you in this facility when you were in the advanced stages of your pregnancy? They looked after us really well once I had to go and be induced. So they took me out at like Wednesday evening and I went to the hospital, got induced, and I had him later on that night. And we get to stay there 24 to 48 hours, depending on whether you bottle feed or breastfeed. How does that work in hospital? Are you, do you have a, somebody looking over you? you? You have a guard there while you give birth? Yes, the officer usually sits in the room 24-7. And you're shackled to the bed unless you're in active labor. Then they actually let you stay unshackled until you give birth. After you give birth, you have to get shackled back to the bed. You're shackled to a bed? Yes. Just your ankle. Just your ankle, but yeah, you're shackled but to you're bed. Shackled, yes. It's not the most propitious no. circumstances in which to have something which is so intensely yes. personal. It was very embarrassing, very embarrassing. May, may I see the cell where you spend most of the, your time? Yes. Thank you. See, yes. How, how different would this be in its physical surroundings if you were at home? At home, he would have his own room. I wouldn't have my bed in here. He would have a dresser, a changing table. What, what would you tell your son when he is old enough about where he was born and the circumstances in which he was born? Um, I really haven't thought about that question yet. Um, I would just tell him that mommy made a big mistake and it was for the better why I came here. It made mommy learn a lot and I hope he can learn from my mistakes and see how embarrassing it was to be here and hopefully he won't ever come to a place like this. You'll tell him he was born in prison? Yes. It's visiting time, and Kim is preparing to take baby Gabriella outside the unit. At times like these, offenders are sharply reminded of where they are. So you have to be accompanied on these visits out, uh, Kim, do you? Um, when we have the babies, yes. Yes. Why is that? Um, just for their safety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's sexual offenders here that have done crimes like that, so that's one of the reasons why we escort them. It's difficult to, to believe that people will want to do anything to a child being yeah. taken out to a visiting area. I know. That it might happen. Yeah. And you have to make sure he doesn't? Yes, sir. This, after all, Kim, is a, is a women's prison. So it's rather difficult to imagine that a woman would do something against a child. Oh, yeah. For me, it's, it's hard for me to fathom that a mother or any woman would be able to do that to a child, but it, it happens. And there's actually women in this prison that have hurt their children. Yeah, well, yeah I couldn't imagine. This is Rockville Correctional Facility, the largest women's prison in the state of Indiana, with more than 1,200 convicts. Lieutenant Brad Gray is taking me to Dormitory 5 one of the largest in the prison. Inmates here are allowed the freedom of the unit during the day. Come nighttime, 
they're locked in. 16 to a room. Are there outbreaks of disorder with 16 women in one small space? Occasionally, yeah, we have, um, just like uh, any other environment where you have that many people in a small space, once they get on each other's nerves to the point that, uh, that they feel a, a physical altercation or, or a verbal altercation is their only means of resolution, then we'll have arguments or fights from time to time. Much more fundamentally, how do you, how do you choose, or do you choose, who is one of the 16 in one of those rooms, and how do you do that? We just do it through, through the offender's behavior. Those, those offenders who, who display more uh, difficult behavior, we have closer to the officer's station. Would you put, say, somebody who's been guilty of check fraud with somebody who's committed murder? Would you, would you put them in one dorm? Yes, we would, because um, it, it, again, is predicated more by the, be the offender's behavior once they're in the environment than it is by the crime, crime that the got behavior. them. Yes, absolutely. I've been told about one of the most difficult people in this unit. Kiana Ball is in for armed robbery. Hello, I'm Trevor. I'm Kiana. How are you? I'm good. It's a very crowded space to be in. Yes, it is. It's, it's kind of odd being in a room with so many females and not really having your own personal space. Like, you have your own personal space, but it's, it seems like it's not enough. What's the atmosphere like when everybody's here? Um, it can be a little off balance, um, a little frustrating, because all the different uh, moods and attitudes, that are, it's like a, a lot of different personalities, and they tend to clash. and you have like half the room has their good days and then half the room has their bad days. So it's like, it's real crazy. It's real crazy. Out of earshot of her cellmates, I asked to talk to Ball about her crime. In 2009, Kiana Ball and her boyfriend Carlton Wright attempted to steal a van at gunpoint. The owner, Rinaldo Santiago, resisted and was shot at point-blank range. This is Ball and Wright moments after the shooting. They hide their weapons in a nearby apartment block. When she was arrested, police discovered these guns in Kiana Ball's handbag. How old are you now? You're... I'm 22. I will be 23 in November. In November. So you were 19 years of age? Yes. When you came to prison? It's a lot to handle, and I have kids at home, so that makes it a little more harder to cope with than anything. How many kids do you have at home? I have two kids at home. I have a little girl, Brianna. She's uh, six. She'll be seven July 16th. And I have a four-year-old son, Ezion. He will be five June 12th. How were you caught? How were you found out? We found ourselves in a jam um, with a guy that we had met. And um, things just got out of hand. And we were, we were trying to rob him. And just things, like I said, things got out of hand. Things got carried away. And he ended up being shot and we you shot him yes how severely was the victim hurt he was severely hurt on the um, left side of his face um, the bullet came into close contact with his eye and you it, shot him in the face yes it came into close contact with the side of his face by his eye um, now he's permanently blind in his left eye wow yes what's your emotional response knowing what the consequence of your action was. I didn't have any feeling at all about it. I didn't feel sorry about it. I didn't regret it. I didn't want to take it back. I didn't want to fix anything. I didn't feel, I didn't feel bad at all. But after the fact, I felt bad because it's like, this is an innocent man. I don't know him from anywhere. He doesn't know me from anywhere. He's never done anything to me because we don't know each other. So when I thought about it, I was like, I almost took an innocent man's life. And your sentence was? Uh, my sentence was, um, I signed a plea, pleading guilty to armed robbery with serious bodily injury, and I was sentenced to 30 years due 15. You, you have to deal, too, with the realization that 
the formative years of your children's development yes. will go on yes. um, without you. It bothers me because like all the little things that I'm missing out on are all the little things that I would love to be there for. Like my son's first day of school, just all the, all the little things is what are the most important to me. So it, it hurts. It is quite conceivable that they might have been out of school by the time you yeah yeah by the time you it's, get out. It's, there's a possibility that's if I don't keep if I don't keep myself out of trouble and I keep down the path that I've found myself being on, getting into trouble constantly in and out of lock. If I if I keep myself on that path, then I'll find myself not getting home to my kids until they're grown, and that's something I don't want to happen. I want to almost until they're adults. <laughs> yes, so I would like to make it home to them before it's too late. I would like to be able to spend some time with them before they're too grown. Kiana Ball is one of those who finds it extremely difficult to cope with life in prison, compounded by the fact that bad conduct has got her an additional nine years. recreation at Rockford. Prisoners have an hour's free time before lights out. The tedium of the unimaginable sameness of long days poses difficulties for even the toughest offenders. And for some, there's the constant pain of living with the memory of what you did. Dawn Hopkins was convicted of the battery and manslaughter of her three-month-old son. After almost 15 years, she's about to be released. Hello. Do you mind if we interrupt your game for a brief while? No, that's okay. How much, how much time do you get to play table um, tennis every day? We spend about an hour a day doing it Monday through Friday. It gives us something to do and gets us off the housing unit. It's a little bit of exercise, but it's not real intense. How long have you been at this facility? I've been incarcerated at this facility for one year, but I've been incarcerated for 14 and a half years. 14 and a half years? Yes, but it's almost over. I have two years left. In like 29 months, I go home. In your darkest moments here, have you reflected on the circumstances which actually brought you to prison? Yes. Um, three months into my incarceration, I tried to take my own life because I couldn't deal with the guilt of what I had done to bring myself here. I was very lucky that an officer found me and saved my life. I hung myself three months into my stay. You tried to hang yourself? Yes, I did. I was facing the rest of my life incarcerated. I was 25 years old. I had taken another person's life, and I couldn't live with that. And I did try to take my own life when I was first incarcerated. So the trigger for your attempting to, to take your own life was the fact that you were looking ahead at this vast expanse of time that you had to do in jail. And the guilt, the guilt of taking somebody's life, the pain that I had caused my family. And I just felt like I was never gonna be able to do anything positive with my life ever again. It must be strange to think of going home after all this time? Actually, it's terrifying. The world has changed in so many ways. And when I'm done, I'll have done 16 years. And the amount of ways that the world has changed in that time, it's scary. And I don't have a lot of family support. So it'll be like standing on my own two feet for the first time in my life. What was your early life like? I was a full-time college student. I have a bachelor's degree in accounting, and I ran a bar that my stepdad owned. When I go home, I also have a degree in philosophy that I've earned since I've been incarcerated. When I go home, I'm hoping to eventually um, own my own like bakery, coffee shop. I want to get my pastry chef license and do that kind of stuff when I go home. You seem to have worked it out pretty well. You, have, uh, you seem determined not to be somebody who comes back and you have a plan for your life in the future. Absolutely. I think that's what you have to do. You have to set goals and you have to s turn your dream into a goal. 
set the steps and accomplish them one at a time to be able to reach your goal. Otherwise, you're just treading water. For most prisoners here, treading water is the sum total of their lives. And I'm about to meet a woman who has spent more time in prison than any other in the state of Indiana. At Indiana Women's Prison, 69 inmates are here for life. They will, of course, be denied any chance of a return to their families. For the majority, that's the agony that constantly haunts them. One of the prisoners here came to this place years ago as a teenager. This is called the Programs Building. My escort is Officer Frank Bryan. Hello. Morning. Welcome. Th thank you. This is our community outreach. Uh -huh. All these ladies up here are working on a quilt, I believe. Yes. Disregard the visiting room meeting. Okay. Meet you at nine this, these are some examples of some of the things they're making. I've been here since I was 16 years old. I've done 38 years, so. You've been no, here since six. Yeah, I don't get out much. Yeah, you've been here since you were 16. Yes. Yeah, but... Uh, That's a pretty early age to come to prison. Yeah. I'm the youngest, I was the youngest offender ever here, and now I'm the longest one to have ever spent as much time here. Yeah. That's your tag, yes? Yes, I've got the shortest DOC number. <laughs> which year did you come to this prison? Which year? In, in 75. Which year? 1975. 1975. Yes. I've never driven a car. Uh, I never went on a date. Um, never had a checking account. I was never able to be a mother. But a lot of these people in here that are younger, I'm mom. Do you have many family connections? Do people come to visit you? My sister does with her kids and her great and her grandkids. So I still have a connection out there. Yeah. How do they regard you? What do they think of you and of your situation? Oh, they want me to come home. They want me to, my... Uh, that hurts. Yeah. Want my two nieces, they went and broke their piggy bank and took their money to their mom, my sister, and said, is this enough to get Aunt Cindy out? Gosh. Yeah. And that, that's what makes me emotional. It's, yeah. it's very difficult for me to talk about, to talk to somebody who's been in this situation for 38 years when I look back on my life and think, all the things I have done mm -hmm. in that time. Yeah. And to some extent, yours has... It's in a box. You came into prison at yeah. age 16. What for? Murder. I committed murder. What were the circumstances in which you killed someone? I was abused. I was extremely abused from a, basically a home that I was living at. And I tried to leave. And I set a fire trying to get out and it got out of hand, and they died in the fire. So you started the fire? Trying to escape. Right, and how many people? Six. Six people were in the house? Yes. And they died? Yes. Did you not know there were people there? I knew the people were there. What I was thinking was, if I set a fire, then everybody can get out and I can run. That was my intentions. The fire got out of hand. How quickly were you apprehended? Uh, a couple of months later. I was in the hospital because I, um, I had burns. Yeah. So you, you burnt yourself too? Trying to save them. That's how I got burnt. I kept trying to go back into the house to get them. Didn't, didn't work? No. No. This is probably a, a brutal way of, 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 of putting it, and I acknowledge that. But the fact is, for you, this is it. Right. You will end your life here. You will end your days here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I am looking forward to growing old in here because... You're uh, looking forward to that? Yes. Because, you know, I, I'm going to know that my life is not going to be much longer. 
and there's something always positive on the other side, and I believe that. It's, it's very good to meet you. It's good to thank meet you. you. Thank you. Thank you for talking to me. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. All of you. Early chow! Line up! Another day is beginning with Rockford. Although the majority of inmates here would be released into the community one day, prisoners talk endlessly about the years of family life. One of the people here, though, is different. She watched her children grow up when, by law, she should have been doing life for murder. Linda Darby's story is remarkable by any standard. In 1972, she escaped from prison. She went on the run for more than 30 years, and in that time, managed to create an entirely new life. To evade capture, she abandoned the family and the town she knew. She set out to start again in a small town in Tennessee. Darby's escape from the Indiana State Women's Prison was bloody. I was scratched up and bloody and everything from going over the barbed wire. For the past 30 years or so, the now 64-year-old has been living in Pulaski. Even Darby doesn't know how she kept her 30-year secret. Married with two children, eight grandchildren, a playset is in the backyard. She cleaned houses for a living. Today, though, this fugitive has a message for people who believed her to be Linda McElroy and not Linda Darby. This is who I am. This is who I am. So you escaped and you decided to make a clean breast of it, uh, start a new life. I just changed my last name, changed one digit to my social security, and that's how I survived. Were you always in a position where you were looking over your shoulder, wondering whether the next tap on your shoulder would be that of a of an arresting officer, a policeman, somebody in authority. There's always the chance. I was just, I just kept asking God, please let me raise my children. I couldn't imagine them not being able to take care of themselves. Did you ever confide in anybody at all about what had no. happened to you? No. There was nobody you felt you could talk to about your life in prison before? I knew that if I involved them, then that would put them in the middle of it too. So no, I did not. But it, 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 it must be difficult when people talk about their lives. Uh, you know, you drift into talking about what you did earlier. How was, how was it possible never to mention anything about your past? to your closest friends? It was hard. It was very hard. But I just kept it within. On the day that policeman came to your house, on that fateful day, what were you, what were you planning to do on that day? I had just got through working. I was working for a uh, cleaning house that day. And we had came in, fixed dinner, and I was sitting at the kitchen table smoking a cigarette. My daughter went to the phone, uh, went to the door, and uh, Joe Robinson, who was the policeman that came to the house, and I knew him for 30 years, he said, I'm gonna show you this picture. And Linda, tell me if you know who this person is. And I said, it's me. He said, no. He said, I told him they were wrong. He said, I've known you 30 years. I said, Joe, what's the sense of me lying? 
I could sit here and lie all day to you and fingerprints don't lie. I said, you'd know it as soon as you took my fingerprints. What did you say to your children? I told them. And they said, Mom, we're behind you 100% because we know what you did didn't do it. I told them that back in 1970, I was accused and convicted then of killing my first or my second husband. What did they say? They said, we don't believe it. We know you didn't do it. And my husband said the same thing. Were you surprised that you were an escaped prisoner for so long? Did it surprise you? Mm -hmm. And now? And now? All I can do is try my best to work my way out legally, walking out the front door. I've never heard a story of somebody who's been on the run for 35 years. I've never heard anything quite like it. Linda Darby will probably die in this prison. But unlike the other women here, she has memories of 35 years of freedom. Indiana Women's Prison. I'm here to see one inmate whose story I had found particularly disturbing. Cindy White has the unenviable record of being the longest serving female prisoner in the state of Indiana. Release for her is unlikely. At the start of her sentence, she was a teenager. She's appealed against that sentence again and again. Cindy White was in court again today, and her attorney asked the judge for just one thing. That the court consider whether she was competent to stand trial at the uh, time that she went to trial in 1976. But the Johnson County prosecutor says Cindy White deserves to be in just one place. In prison for the murder of uh, a number of people. Six people, Charles and Carol Robertson, with four of their children, who all burned in a fire that White set more than 20 years ago in this Greenwood neighborhood. I set the fire. It wasn't to kill anybody. It was to ask my way of asking for help. But White now says that she was not fit to stand trial back in 1976. She claims that she had been traumatized by years of sexual abuse by her father and even by the people she eventually murdered. Today, Cindy White hopes that a judge will overturn her murder convictions. None of her appeals has been successful. Her last was about 10 years ago. Remember my extended family? I said that I have created it here. About that, yeah. Well, this lady right here that's needle pointing, this is my daughter, Evie. All right. Uh, Hello, Evie. Hello. How are you doing? I'm fine. How are you? Has she taught you a lot? Yes. Yeah. She's probably the strongest woman I've ever met. Really? Why do you say that? Because I can't imagine being faced with what she's been faced with and staying as strong as she is. Having been here for such a, such a long time. Yes. And I just, I love her. Here, it's kind of like, you see what you get. It's... We've all been kind of in the same boat, hurt, disappointed, despair. So when you can reach out to someone that's walked in your shoes, then it makes it easier. So which is, which is your I'm space? in the bottom one, uh -huh. the messy one. Welcome to my home. Wow. Home which is shared with. Yes. This is my bunkie. Would you introduce Hello. yourself? Cheyenne Pennington. Hello. 
and uh, we get along really well. I'm mama to her, yep. she says. Yeah. So another and member of your extended family. Yes, uh, I get them without even realize I have them. And which is your bunk? This is my bunk. This is where I am secluded in. I come wow. in, and when I don't want to be bothered with somebody or just alone, I will pull out and get down there and hide for just a little bit. You must have seen uh, people come and go here oh, over yeah. the years. Um, yeah, this unit, there's a lot of ins and outs, what we call they finish their time and they go home. And I really don't deal with them too much because, well, it hurts. Because you see people who come here, you get to know them, and then they leave and you stay. Yeah, and it hurts. I'm not gonna say it doesn't. Uh, because I really wanted to have that hope of going home. But as it is now, I know what's for real and I had to be in reality. I can't hope on ho false hopes. But it's a, it's a recurring hurt because you see people come and go oh, yes. constantly. I'm, ex I'm excited to see them go home because I know that they're going to be doing th something that I can't do. And that is be with their family. But I have made a family in here to take away the pain. Why do they keep you? Why in your mind have they decided to keep you in these conditions? I don't know. That's a question I ask all the time is, what is it that I am not doing? You know, if they tell me what it is that I can do to say, okay, yes, you can go, I'll be more than happy to. I'll be more than happy to do it. You've been up for parole? I've been up several times, and each time I'm refused. And I finally got tired I, I, because the disappointment when I go up before him, I'm like, yes, this year I'm going home. I just know it. There's no other way. But I'm tired of doing that. And I'm tired of getting my feelings hurt. And I figured this way, if they haven't let me go in the 37 years that I have tried to go, they're never going to let me go. So I've got to make do with what I have and make the best of it. How have you survived this for so many years? I tried to find somebody worse off than me. I try to find someone that needs a kind word, that needs a hug, that needs to be shown that they care. I need to care for something or someone. I want to love. I want to be loved. It's a kind of escape mm -hmm. from which there is, in fact, no escape. Yeah. It's just that you find that thing that makes you want to say, okay, I'm going to be okay today, and hold on to it. However you mentally come to terms with it, it's a very difficult adjustment to make. I want something to show for my life other than a DOC number. A prison, when, prison record number. Right. And right now, I don't have it. There's nothing out there that says Sarah Cindy White exists other than the number. I'm on my way again to the Rockville Correctional Facility for the last time. Of the litany of crimes you hear about in this prison, perhaps the most shocking is that of a mother who kills her child. I'd come to see an inmate I'd met before. Dawn Hopkins is now looking forward to her release. She had been forced to give up her first two children because she'd abused them. But in 2001, she was convicted of killing her third child, three-month-old Noah. How often do you reflect on the chain of circumstances which 
actually got you here. Sometimes it just sneaks up on you like that and you don't even realize it and you're happy and then you realize that you're sad, you know, and it's something that maybe it's a song that played or something that somebody said or last weekend was Mother's Day and somebody wished me a happy Mother's Day and it was <laughs> not good. It, it just brings all of that back. Your son was only three months old, the realization that you took the life of someone to whom you gave birth must be probably the most horrendous thing of all. Absolutely. You know, I, uh, I can still remember when I found out I was pregnant. You know, I was six weeks pregnant and they did this ultrasound and there was this little life and, you know, they told me he was like an inch and a half long. And at that moment, you could see his heartbeat and I promised at that moment to keep him safe forever. And I didn't. And that makes me feel like a monster. And it makes me feel like I don't even deserve to be alive some days. As an educated person, you must go through a lot of self-analysis. You must look back and try to analyze your actions. I don't, I honestly don't even have an answer for you. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I uh, struggled with postpartum depression after the birth of my son. Um, I was seeing a psychologist regularly. I was actually in his office the day that I took the life of my son. It was a normal everyday day. I had been to the craft store to buy a Christmas stocking for him. It was right before Halloween and I sat, you know, working on the little felt pieces for this stocking for him for his first Christmas and you know, it was just him and I that day, and I, I don't know. He was fussy because he was running, a, had a cold, and I don't know, I, I lost my temper. And I should have been better than that. Was that a moment of blind rage? In a moment, life changed, you know, I was sitting on the couch feeding him, giving him a bottle, and talking to my mom on the phone, watching The Simpsons. And 15 minutes later, I was on the phone to the paramedics, getting instructions on doing CPR, because he wasn't breathing. Wow. Go gosh, that's a terrible, it's a terrible moment. Life happens in a moment, you know, and you never, you take life for granted. You never realize what moment it's going to be that your life is going to change forever. Well, what did you do when you discovered your son wasn't breathing? I called the paramedic. I called 911, talked to the paramedics, began performing CPR until a police officer came in and took over CPR. Then the paramedics got there. We all went in an ambulance to the hospital. Um, they after, I don't know, about, they called in saying that they had a child coming in with unresponsive. So they had a chaplain there waiting to talk to me when I got there. And uh, they were able to get his heart beating again, but due to the brain damage, his, he was not breathing on his own. So he they, suffered brain damage? Yes. Um, he's, he died from shaken baby syndrome. How quickly did they blame you? for your son's death. But they didn't blame me. I was honest with them. I told them exactly what happened as much as I could remember. Because at that point, all I wanted to do was save his life as possible. And it didn't matter what happened to me. Going through that long process of being in police custody, that must have been pretty traumatic, knowing what had happened. There were death threats made against me. And um, what, what, why people thought you were you were a child killer. A yes. mother who kills her child is probably held up as one of the most yes, the horrific most contemptuous people. contemptuous in our society. I mean, the only other, the most contemptuous would be a sex offender, you know, somebody that's a pedophile. Other than that, you're baby killers. So you were classed as a baby killer? I was that. I am that. I'm a lot more than that as well, but that's who I am.
I eventually took my leave of Indiana and the many women behind bars in this state. The thoughts that stay with me are of horrendous crimes and the staggeringly long sentences. The thoughts, too, of wasted lives and the families left behind.